In this video, we're going to look at the function of nitroglycerin from two different perspectives. First, we'll talk about the mechanism of action of nitroglycerin, and then we'll look at the use of nitroglycerin in the pre-hospital environment and the implications this may have for the STEMI patient. So when we look at the mechanism of action of nitroglycerin, really we're talking about the, nitro the mechanism of action of nitrous oxide. As nitroglycerin enters the body, it's very quickly converted into nitrous oxide, which is actually going to have the activating effects uh, that will lead to the, the pathways that uh, ultimately cause vascular relaxation. So nitroglycerin is converted into nitrous oxide in the body, and as nitrous oxide levels or the concentration increases in the body, what we start to see is activation of a enzyme called guanylyl cyclase. So nitrous oxide levels are actually going to activate an enzyme called guanylyl cyclase. And as we have activation of guanylyl cyclase, that is going to convert something called GTP. So the guanylyl cyclase converts GTP into CGMP. And it's the CGMP which activates the kinase pathways, which will lead to the actual functions that lead to vascular relaxation. So CGMP is going to activate internal kinase pathways, which will perform the functions or basically act on the channels that are required uh, to have vascular relaxation. So acts on a kinase pathway, and those kinase pathways are going to lead to an increase in reuptake of calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum or the endoplasmic reticulum, the vascular smooth muscle that acts as the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So the kinase pathway is going to lead to an increase in our reuptake of calcium. And as we have this reuptake of calcium, it's going to open uh, calcium-gated po uh, potassium channels and the opening of those potassium gated or those calcium gated potassium channels is going to lead uh, to the activation of a phosphatase. So reuptake of calcium ultimately is going to lead to activation of a phosphatase. And we know that uh, these types of enzymes are going to lead to dephosphorylation. So ultimately the end effect is that this phosphatase will lead to dephosphorylation of the light chain uh, myosin bridges. So we start to see um, dephosphorylation of the light chain myosin. And the end effect of this, or this dephosphorylation is going to lead to deactivation of the actin and myosin bridges, which will then lead to vasodilation, or we start to see relaxation of our muscles. So just to kind of recap, we go through a process through which nitrous oxide activation or nitrous oxide concentration concentrations are going to lead to activation of guanylyl cyclase. Guanylyl cyclase is going to trigger the conversion of GTP into CGMP. CGMP is going to activate a kinase pathway, which leads to the reuptake of calcium. Increased calcium levels are actually going to open potassium or calcium-gated potassium channels, which will lead to the activation of a phosphatase. This Phosphatase is going to lead to dephosphorylation of our light chain myosin, and essentially we're going to inhibit these actin myosin uh, connections, which are causing vascular contraction, and we'll get uh, relaxation. So we see reuptake of calcium in our sarcoplasmic reticulum. So we're start, starting to see increased concentrations of calcium, calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and we see dephosphorylation of our light chain myosin, which is going to impair the ability of contraction. And ultimately, again, the end effect of this is going to be vascular relaxation. We know there are some benefits to this. So we're looking at the patient um, who is having an acute coronary syndrome. So we're looking at myocardial ischemia, an angina event, or potentially a STEMI. That vascular relaxation is going to help uh, do a couple of things that we like. So one is that we're going to see a decrease in preload. So as we start to see dilation of our uh, vasculature, not as much blood is returning to the heart. That reduction in preload is going to mean we have uh, less oxygen demand or the heart has to work, or doesn't have to work as hard to eject that blood. Um, so we start to see a decrease in our MVO2 associated with that. The other piece is we get vascular relaxation is blood pressure can drop, uh, which will lead to a decrease in afterload. And similarly to a decrease in preload, a decrease in afterload is going to decrease our MVO2. 
Finally, one of the other benefits of nitroglycerin use um, is that vascular relaxation can happen in the coronary arteries. So we can see uh, coronary artery dilation, which in some cases can actually improve myocardial oxygen supply as we dilate an artery that is uh, potentially being stenotic. So those are some of the things that, or that's a mechanism of action of nitroglycerin and how it's actually going to function when it's being administered. Now that we've talked about the mechanism of action of nitroglycerin, I'd like to talk about pre-hospital use of nitroglycerin in STEM patients. In 2010, the HA guidelines were updated to include a suggestion that nitroglycerin should be limited to three doses in the pre-hospital patient who's experiencing an ST elevation myocardial infarction. This was based on moderate evidence, so it wasn't particularly strong evidence, but moderate evidence to suggest that there were a few risks. One was the potential for an increase in post-operative bleeding. There is some theoretical evidence to suggest that nitroglycerin has antiplatelet effects and can impact the ability of platelet function following PCI, especially at doses that are higher than normal pharmacological levels or pharmaceutical levels. So when we're looking at pre-hospital administration of nitroglycerin, we could be looking at a large amount of nitroglycerin being administered in the pre-hospital environment, followed by IV nitroglycerin being uh, provided uh, in operative cases, which can lead to a lot of nitroglycerin being in that patient's system, and then potentially having the impact or the antiplatelet impact that can lead to an increased risk of post-operative bleeding. The other piece was there was a potential risk for restenosis. So as we talked about, nitroglycerin is going to dephosphorylate the uh, myosin light chains and going to lead to relaxation. As nitroglycerin is removed from the body or concentrations of nitrous oxide decrease, then we can see the reversal of that effect. And there's the potential risk that we have restenosis. So we're getting artificially dilated vessels that when the nitroglycerin wears off, we have restenosis. The other risk is associated with a reduction in blood pressure. So uh, the potential for nitroglycerin to decrease blood pressure substantially and then exacerbate cardiogenic shock. So as we're seeing nitroglycerin being administered and we're having the vasodilation, blood pressure is falling, which leads to poor myocardial perfusion and can actually lead to more negative outcomes. That's one of the things that were being considered at the time. And then following that was the, just the potential increase for a risk in post negative post-operative outcomes. So patients who are being treated with more than three pre-hospital doses of nitroglycerin were more likely to experience negative post-operative outcomes following PCI. So what about now? When we look at, has anything been updated since 2010? There hasn't been a substantial revision to the HA guidelines since 2010 or review of these findings in order to make new recommendations. There are a few more studies out there that suggest a couple of things. One, there's little evidence to suggest that nitroglycerin use, especially when limited to three doses in patients who are not contraindicated, that there is a significant impact on blood pressure that would lead to poor ejection fractions, poor myocardial perfusion, uh, or more progressive infarct or injury to the myocardium. So in most patients, nitroglycerin is safe um, to use, and we're not going to see a substantial reduction in blood pressure for those patients when it's being administered in the proper way. So the patient's not contraindicated, and we're not providing excessive doses of nitroglycerin. So little impact in terms of uh, nitroglycerin on blood pressure in patients who are experiencing STEMI. The other piece though, is that there is now more reasonable evidence uh, through additional retrospective studies that suggest that nitroglycerin administration may be associated with an increase in major adverse coronary events um, following PCI. So the more nitroglycerin someone gets in the pre-hospital environment or in the hospital environment, there is an increased potential for major adverse coronary events uh, for those patients, especially if we're looking at that patient from the 30-day to one-year mark. What's interesting about this is uh, the patient's Kiplin score and ejection fraction are controlled for. So even in patients who have very uh, high signs of uh, heart failure following uh, myocardial infarction, which would be the Kiplin score, or they have a dramatically reduced ejection fraction. When we control for those and we look at just nitroglycerin administration as a predictor of outcome, there is some predictive effects that uh, more nitroglycerin or nitroglycerin administration is associated with an increase in major adverse coronary events. So it just further helps support some of uh, our directives or the pre-hospital directive in terms of limiting nitroglycerin use in the STEMI patient 
based on the fact that there really can be, or it looks like nitroglycerin is going to somehow impact the patient's outcome following PCI. 